Chris came down to the end of the stage and he looks at me deeply sincerely. And he says, Jada, I meant no harm. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavior Lights. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and television shows all over the world. Jada Pinkett Smith has been all over the news lately promoting her new book, Worthy. In numerous interviews on different platforms, she has opened up about her childhood, her marriage or lack of marriage to Will Smith, and she spoke up about the Oscars, the slap, and Chris Rock. But what do her body language, facial expressions, and word choice reveal? And why did this sentence set off some red flags for me? And he looks at me deeply, sincerely. And he says, Jada, I meant no harm. There is a lot to cover on this topic, especially because she did a lot of interviews and some of them were short, but some of them were really long. And I wanted to watch them all just to see key differences in the ways that she says things, what's similar, what's different. And there's a lot of great stuff. Now, a lot of people have seen the interviews she did on the Today Show. And as great as those were, they were very edited and cut up in ways where things that I wanted to see were missing. So I wanted to use a longer interview. So most of the footage that I'll be using for this analysis will be from her interview with People and her interview with Jay Shetty on his podcast. Because in both these cases, even if there are edits, there were longer answers, especially with Jay Shetty because he let her talk for a while and they're friends. So she felt comfortable opening up quite a bit more. So we're getting a lot more information in that interview. There are also a lot of topics that they covered in all these interviews. And although I watched them all and I'm considering all her behaviors into my baseline and in this analysis, we're mainly gonna focus on the conversations about Will Smith, the Oscars, Chris Rock, and all that stuff. So with that said, let's dive right in. There was so much that people didn't know in regards to what was happening with Will and I at that time. And I, I will leave for people to get the Read book. The, yeah, absolutely. That I think would give people a lot more context to understand that moment. When I first saw Chris's name come on stage, come up as one of the presenters, I said, oh boy. I looked to Will and I was like, he's not going to be able to help himself. This is going to be something. I was like, I knew. I already knew. Because of history that Chris and I had um, in regards to the 2016 Oscar So White. And I'll let people read to get up to speed on that. All right. So I want to start off by saying that Jada is very expressive and has a lot of consistency in the way that she expresses herself, making her overall a pretty easy read. If I was doing one of my shows where I bring people up from the audience and I start telling them things about themselves, she'd be a pretty much ideal candidate. And I will prove that, by the way, later in this video, I will prove that the way she communicates gives us a lot of information about what she's thinking and how she's feeling. But even in this first clip that we just saw, we're getting a ton of those consistent behaviors. A great example is when she says, give people a lot of context. And we see quite a few things happening in that moment. One of them is we see the hands turn palm up like this as her eyes open up wide and her eyebrows go up with context. So let's start with the hands being upwards. So palm orientation is really fascinating because it's a gesture that's been highly researched and we know that it's not universal. Depending on where you are in the world, when people communicate, the hands have different orientations in different cultures. In English speakers, sideways is the most common orientation that we see. English speakers communicate a lot like this. That being said, palms up seems to have a certain connotation across cultures and it's the concept of taking or giving. So whenever there's an exchange, we often see cultures that don't use palm up very frequently turn palm up. So when we talk about giving something or asking for something, taking something, wherever there's an exchange, this kind of thing is common. And it doesn't always have to be a physical exchange either. We could be asking for forgiveness, we could be asking for mercy, we could be asking for grace, and we might see those hands go up like this. You could be watching a foreign film and you see someone go up to someone like this and you might be able to deduce that they're asking for something. In the same moment, we see her eyes open and her eyebrows go up. So her eyebrows are really fascinating. They do often go up as she's talking. But most of the time, and you can look for this moving forward, her, when her voice goes up to emphasize something, those eyebrows go up as well. It's almost perfectly synced. There are moments where that voice goes up with the eyebrows and then comes back down with the eyebrows. So 
using the eyebrows to emphasize is very common. We do see this everywhere in the world. In fact, research has shown that in a conversation where we're giving someone directions, just before the most important part of that direction, those eyebrows tend to go up. It's a way to signal someone, okay, now this is important, pay attention. So in this moment, she is literally talking about giving context. So it's, it's kind of perfect. She's saying giving and those hands are turning palm up and she's really emphasizing that. This is important, eyes wide open, eyebrows up. And she does this a lot throughout the interview where there are these moments that come up where there's information that we want and she says, you know, if you read the book, you'll get this information. And in this moment, it's very important to her that the context that we get in the book will allow us to understand this situation. In fact, throughout the interview, she says, you know, even in this clip, she said it twice. She said, you know, I'll allow people to get the book. And then later she said, I'll let people read about that, inferring that there's more information in the book. And she keeps doing this where she'll say, and I talk about this in the book, I mention this in the book, and I get it. This is a book tour. It's a promotion. That's what she's doing. But there are a lot of moments where it kind of seems like she's saying, there's so much going on that I cover in the book. And if you read it, you'll understand this situation. And this is one of those moments. This context is so important and it's her job to give us this very important context. But we have to get the book because the context is in the book. When she talks about Chris Rock first coming out on stage at the Oscars, we see a couple of things. First, we see a lot of this scratching the nose. And it's interesting because that almost feels deliberate. Like there's a niche on her nose and she's trying to get it. It doesn't seem like a subconscious gesture out of stress or nervousness. It could be. There is research that indicates that when we're stressed, the blood flow in our face changes and that shift can cause us to, you know, we see this kind of thing, a lot of this kind of thing. So it could be that, but it almost really seems like she's trying to get an itch deliberately in that moment. But immediately after that, her hands come down on her lap cupped like this. Now this position is quite common for her throughout this interview. She's often sitting like that. But what she's not always doing is pacifying, or in this case, what we call wringing or washing the hands. So we see this kind of gesture where she's doing this, which we call pacifying or adapting in the research. And adapters or pacifiers or self-soothing gestures are massage-like gestures, often repetitive, that help reduce stress. So in this moment, as she's talking about Chris Rock coming out, we're seeing that adapting. I do feel she's feeling the stress of that moment, obviously a very stressful topic. Then she says that she turned to Will and she knew this was going to be something. I knew, I just knew. So we see a bunch of things in that moment. With the first I knew, we see a shrug. It's a shrug that involves the eyebrows. Again, she emphasizes with the voice, I knew, and the eyebrows go up, but also she's shrugging with the shoulders at the same time. Now my regular viewers know I love the shrugs. Uh, the best research on shrugging was conducted at Université Paris-Nanterre and they found that a lot of things can be involved in a shrug. It could be shoulders, it could be eyebrows and shoulders, it could be hands, eyebrows and shoulders, a bit of a head tilt. A lot of things constitute a shrug, but conversationally, it often denotes a lack of something or a disengagement. I don't something. I don't know. I don't care. I have nothing to add. It's a shortcoming, something we don't have. And in this case, it looks a lot like she's saying, there's nothing I could have done about it. Like I knew, but I was powerless. I don't have the power to do anything here. So this is called an attitudinal shrug of incapacity. So imagine if somebody comes up asking you for something, asking for your help, and you just go, I, I can't help you. I don't know how to help you. Like I can't do anything about this. That's what it looks like. It's a sense of powerlessness to what she knew was coming. Then she says, I already knew. And she kicks her head back like this, and there's a slow blink for a moment, and then her eyes shoot up like this, almost like an eye roll. The eyes aren't rolling, but it almost has the feeling of an eye roll. And we're gonna talk a lot about that gesture because it's quite consistent. So put a pin in that, we're gonna talk about it. When Chris said what he said, I looked to Will as if to say, see, I knew it, <laughs> right? Um, and then I was like, oh boy, that's not cool. Okay, there's nothing you can, like, it's, it's, it's not something that can be cured, right? And that how many stories I had heard of people, you know, young people committing suicide and the shame and just how many people suffer. As far as my condition, and as you can see, my hair is growing back. That's what it does. It'll grow, it'll fall out, it'll grow back again. Pieces of my eyebrows will fall out, grow back. You know, I'm having a good moment right now. My alopecia is not as extreme as most people 
who are dealing with that condition. So I wasn't, I wasn't upset about me. And I, I don't remember actually rolling my eyes. I think what people saw was me looking at Will going, I told you, I knew he was going to do that. And oh boy, here we go again. There is a big theme in that clip. And that theme is taking control of the narrative. So she is addressing a lot of things in that clip that people were saying after the event online in comments without directly mentioning those comments. So she starts off by saying that as soon as that joke came, she looked at Will and that look basically meant, see, I knew he was going to do that. So obviously one of the big things that was flying around was that after the joke, Jada looked at Will Smith to like set him off, to like let him know like you better do something about this. In this moment, she's even laughing about it. She's trying to lighten it to say, no, no. So basically she's saying a lot of people out there said that, but that's not what I did. I looked at him as if to say, see, I knew he was going to do that. But she's leaving out the part where she says a lot of people were saying this. She's not addressing that. She's just correcting it without saying what others were talking about. She does it again immediately after as she talks about alopecia. So I would know this because my coverage of that event was the most viral video in the history of this channel. It's the reason a lot of you found the channel and it was trending on YouTube for a couple of days. So I heard everything that people were saying about this event. And one of the things people were saying is that she doesn't even have alopecia because her hair grows evenly. She knows that. This is all, this whole segment is about her addressing these comments. She knows those comments are out there, which is why here she's taking this little pause to talk about how her alopecia manifests. It almost seems defensive, but it wouldn't be clear why. She even says that her case wasn't as extreme. You know, it'll grow in, it'll fall out. I'm having, you know, a good phase right now. So she goes into a lot of detail as to how this manifests. And you wouldn't really expect that. You would expect her to just say, you know, here's my experience with alopecia, blah, 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 blah. But she takes a lot of time to talk about that. And it's because she's directly addressing those comments. And then she says something that made me so happy, made me smile from ear to ear. She says that she doesn't even remember rolling her eyes and she starts explaining what she was thinking, how she was feeling in that moment. And she says she was thinking, I knew this was going to happen. Here we go again. I knew he was going to do that. And oh boy, here we go again. And those words sounded really familiar to me because a day after the slap happened over a year ago, I analyzed her facial expressions in that moment and I said this about the eye roll. So it's kind of like a slower eye roll. And we do this when something that we're used to dealing with comes up again. Oh, here we go again. Not this again. Like she's dealt with this kind of joke before. Exactly the same words. Here we go again in reaction to something that we're used to. And I love this because it's such a great demonstration of how behavioral analysis works. So occasionally I get comments on the channel. I certainly got some on that video where the person might say, you can't know, you can't know from someone doing that with their eyes that they're thinking, here we go again, because when I'm thinking that, I don't do that with my eyes. And I see two problems with that comment. The first one is, we don't know what we're doing. Like it always makes you laugh when people go, no, no, I don't do that when I lie, I do this. It's like, no, you don't know, that's the whole point. Our body language, our facial expressions leak certain information subconsciously. It's not gestures that we're doing consciously, like, ooh, I'm angry now, let me bring down my eyebrows and open up my eyes and clench my jaw. It just happens. And the second thing is, of course we can't know based on a gesture exactly what someone's thinking. But based on context, based on the experience of having seen this gesture many times before, based on the research, it all comes together to give us a clue as to what's likely happening. And in that case, I saw something that I'm very familiar with, which is that look of familiar irritation and here we go again. And here she is a year later saying she didn't know that she did that, but she was thinking, here we go again. Okay, now we're gonna move on and look at her talking about her marriage or her relationship with Will Smith and some inconsistencies that are coming up that don't exactly line up and what they might suggest. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. It like, wasn't like I looked at Will and said, you know, you know. I know, but, and that's the kind of, you know, th those are the kind of moments of context that yeah. I, I lost sometimes. Listen, there was an aspect of that that I was as shocked as anyone because Will and I hadn't been referring to each other as husband and wife since 2016. I was like, wife? Mm -hmm. oh, me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. I am. I'm okay. That's right. I am your wife.
I had no idea that that was none whatsoever. And I came as family. I actually didn't go to the Oscars as Will's wife. Will and I had been set, like, we weren't living as husband and wife mm -hmm. since 2016. I was happy he asked me to go. Okay, so again, right in the beginning, we have this mocking. It's not like I looked at Will and said, you know, like she's joking like about how, it's not like I looked at him and I signaled him to go do something. Again, she's addressing that public opinion of people saying, you know, she was the one who caused them to go do that. Then we go into this very confusing little bit where she says that she wasn't there as his wife, she was there as family, which I mean, that, that, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because like, what does that mean? Like, were you there as his great aunt, twice removed? Like, what, what do you mean? You were there as family and you're not his sister or his niece so clearly you were a significant other. So we're getting caught in semantics here that she's using to justify how she was confused when he used the word wife. She was like, me, I'm the wife? Oh yeah, that's right, I'm the wife. And to me that's a little bizarre because given the fact that they're not divorced on paper, given the fact that we don't know the details of what's going on with their relationship, wife would have been a very acceptable thing for him to use to talk about her. I mean, did she really expect him to go back to his seat and be like, keep my ex-wife that I still live with and we're not divorced on paper and things are a little rocky and we're kind of seeing other people and she had this thing with our son's friend but we talked about it at the red table so we're totally working it out. Name out your mouth. Like we know, we know who the wife is. So if she was confused at him using the word wife, she would have been the only person in that room to be confused by the use of the word wife. And I think the reason she's doing this, you know, throwing this confusion as the title wife is to preempt how rocky or indecisive they were about the status of their relationship because that will play to her favor. It's important for her for us to know that for some time now, since 2016, there really hasn't been much certainty. But we're going to see that fluctuate. We're going to see that certainty fluctuate moving forward. I understand why people blame me. I don't think it's right, but I understand. You know, considering the narratives that were out there, I have to take responsibility for that. And I talk about that in the book. You know, me being the adulterous wife that had, you know, pushed Will to his limit. I get it. So I couldn't even take any of it personally. And I had to put myself in the shoes of the audience and go, if I was looking at this, how it, what would I say? So there are things about this segment that I liked and that actually gave me a bit of relief. And one that I think a lot of you noticed is that she said that she's the adulterous wife. And the moment she said that, for me, it was like, <sighs> Finally. So for those of you who've been following the story, know that for a very long time, she referred to her affair with their son's friend as an entanglement. Yeah, and then I got into an entanglement with August. That's what I said. An entanglement? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about this when we covered the Red Table conversation between Jada and Will. And I said that an entanglement might be something like this but an affair is not an entanglement. Now, I get that by dictionary definition, an entanglement can mean an affair, but to me it always felt like she went to a thesaurus and she looked up affair and just went through the words and chose the one that has the least negative feeling to it. And she goes, ooh, ooh, entanglement, that's a good one. I had an entanglement. So I don't know if publicly before this she called it, you know, affair or adultery or something else. I just thought for a very long time it was entanglement. This is the first I hear her actually calling it what it is. Those of you who follow Jada's content a little bit more, let us know in the comments, did she use adulterous or, you know, adultery or affair before these interviews that she's doing now? Or did she stick to that entanglement up until this moment? Because as far as I know, this is the first I heard her not say entanglement, not use what we call psychological distancing, where we use words that are less severe to make our actions seem less bad, and she's actually calling herself the adulterous wife. For me, that was a relief. When she says, I get it, we see what we call a chin thrust, and we got this nice side angle where she goes, I understand, and you know, it's not nice, but I understand, and then she goes, I get it, and we see that chin kind of come forward. Now, this is something that often signals 
an offense, like going offensive on something. We often see this kind of thing when things are getting heated, when things are about to get aggressive. And I'm not saying it's overly aggressive, I'm not saying it's this big hidden aggression, but I do think that she has a problem with this narrative out there, that she's the cause of this. Now that segment, the one we're looking at right now, is going to cause a lot of mixed feelings. There are gonna be people who are gonna come out and say, that's so great of her to take accountability and to finally just say, you know, adulterous wife and that she's working on it, that's great. Some other people are gonna look at it and go, no, it's fake, it's all part of this, her trying to be humble and trying to just seem like she's grounded and I see right through it. I can't tell you what your intuition makes you feel. Behaviorally, there isn't much I could point to there that would make me say, this is completely made up, this is completely fake. I think what we're getting is she understands why people are saying that, but she really doesn't like that people are saying that. And at the same time, there was love and compassion for Chris. There was that. Oh, yeah. Was you know, I talk about that in the book. Mm -hmm. I've worked with Chris. I know Chris. Am I always a fan of Chris's stage work? No. But Chris as a person, he's a sweet guy. There was a moment when Chris came down to the end of the stage. And you have to understand, I'm in deep confusion. And he looks at me deeply, sincerely. And he says, Jada, I meant no harm. And it was so sincere in his eyes. I'm like, that's the Chris I know. That's the Chris that a lot of people don't get to see because people just see Chris on stage doing what Chris does. But I'm glad I had that moment. So were my feelings hurt when I heard what was happening as far as the Netflix? Of course, my feelings were hurt. But I didn't take it personally. Because I, I can see his eyes right now as I'm talking to you. And that's the truth of Chris's spirit. Jada meant no harm. We're gonna cover some body language really quickly here, but then move on to the bigger point, which has been blowing my mind. So we're seeing a lot of open palm gestures here, and we're seeing it with the shoulders. So earlier we said how open palm often suggests an exchange, asking for something, you know, giving something. But here, as she's talking about the version of Chris that people don't get to see, both her shoulders come up with her hands like this, and she starts gesturing like this. Then they come back up with both hands as she says, so are my feelings hurt? When I heard about the Netflix, and again, we see this gesture. So, palms up with the shoulders is part of a shrug. And it's interesting here because it goes up with the shrug, and then she gestures with it, relaxes, then back up, and this again. So in this case, again, her shrug is pretty consistent because it's an incapacity. Because she's saying that's the Chris that people don't get to see. Like, I can't show him to you because he doesn't show that side of himself to people. And then from there, she gestures to, they just see Chris on stage, and we have this back and forth with the palms still up. And that could very well be that she's thinking of him on stage, and she knows that an artist on stage, a stand-up comedian, there is an exchange with the audience. You know, he, he dishes out the jokes, takes the applause, so she's talking about that verbal exchange. And then the same thing happens when she shrugs on, was I hurt? And in this case, again, I think it denotes a certain incapacity and it's, how could I not be hurt? Like, I don't know how to control that. Yeah, I was hurt. So it's like almost like obvious, like a duh, as she goes there and she says, when I heard about the Netflix, and again, we see the hands back and forth. And there's a lot, of, I mean, listen, we can't look at that gesture and say it for sure means that, but often when we gesture like this, it means some sort of exchange. And it's not like it's part of her baseline to constantly do this, so in this moment, I believe it might be that when she's thinking of Netflix, she is thinking about like, you know, he dished something out, Will slapped him. He dished out the Netflix, now I'm talking about him. So there's this back and forth between the Smiths and Chris Rock. But here's the big one. This is the big one. It was like a train across my head and such an amazing, amazing example of why the way we ask questions matter. We talk so much on the channel about the way to ask questions. I have a whole video that talks about the best way you could formulate questions or talk to someone to get the truth out of them. I'll leave a link in the description to that. And it's a game changer. Honestly, I've got so many comments on that video of people who shifted the way they communicate and it's amazing the results you'll see. But this is a perfect demonstration 
as to why the way we ask questions changes something. So look at the way she's telling this story of, of Chris Rock's apology to her. It seems so sincere and that it made a real impression on her. She says it was sincere. She's closing her eyes. She's reliving it. She says how vivid it was. She says how she connected. And then she goes on, by the way. I, I used a small clip, but she goes on to say how she felt his heart in that moment. And she says the words, Jada, I meant no harm, twice. Those exact same words. And at the end, she even says, I could see right now, as I'm talking to you, I can see it. Like, it's so vivid to her. Jada, I meant no harm. So to me, that moment felt like he gave her this super heartfelt, sincere apology and that she vividly remembers those words, Jada, I meant no harm. And there's no problem with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Until I watched her interview with people. Listen to her tell that same story now. I just remember when Chris came down to the end of the, to the, end of the stage and tried to apologize to me. He said, I didn't mean you any harm. It's an entirely different tone. First of all, where's that sincerity? Where's that I still see it now? It was so sincere. She says, tried to apologize to me. It was an attempt. He attempted to apologize. Not that it was sincere, not that she could see it in her mind. He tried to apologize. And as she says, tried to apologize, we see those eyes and we see those eyebrows emphasizing this try to, this attempt to apologize. And then listen to the words that she says that he said, I didn't mean you any harm. Now, I understand. I understand that that's very close to Jada, I meant no harm. But if you really look at it, there's actually a lot of differences between the two. For example, here she doesn't mention that he said her name, Jada. Whereas with Jay Shetty, both times she said, Jada, I meant no harm. Not, I didn't mean you any harm. So again, I get that they're close enough that like, the sentiment is the exact same. But in the first one, she represented it as she so vividly remembers it that I at least felt like those words are forever engraved in her memory exactly as he said it. I felt like she was telling me exactly what he said, word for word. If you, if you came to me after the Jay Shetty interview and said, which words did Chris Rock say to Jada? I would go, he said, Jada, I meant no harm. He said those words. After the People magazine, if you ask me right now, what specific words did he say? I tell you, I don't know. I don't know what specific words he said. He said something along the lines of, I didn't mean you any harm. I meant you no harm. I didn't want to harm you. I didn't want to hurt you. Don't know. And I could tell you with pretty high confidence why there's a difference between these two responses. Do you now, watching this video, remember the question that Jay Shetty asked her? It wasn't anything like, so did Chris Rock talk to you? Open-ended. Let's take a look at the way he formulated his question. And at the same time, there was love and compassion for Chris. There was that. Oh, yeah. Was that. So I've said this before. I like Jay Shetty as an interviewer. I think he does an effective job. He lets his guests talk for quite a bit. He asks open-ended questions and he really lets them get those emotions out. And this is why I chose his interview. And I do encourage you guys to go check out the entire interview with Jada that he had because this is where we see the most long answers. But that was a leading question because he's saying that, you know, and of course there was love and compassion for Chris. And what he's doing there is he's taking these love and compassion goggles and he's putting them on Jada. And she's coloring her experience and her story in love and compassion. Because in this interview with Jay Shetty's crowd, that's what will work. But People Magazine, now that's a different thing. That's gossip. That's excitement, right? It's not the pe that's shorter clips that get the drama going. So of course, in that case, the loving compassion angle may not be as effective. But saying, you know, he tried to apologize to me and kind of leaving it a little open-ended might be more effective. So I have no way of knowing, by the way, what question was asked by People Magazine interviewers, but I bet it had less to do with love and compassion than someone like Jay Shetty for who that's a theme in his conversation. This for me was a great demonstration of two things. The first is why we don't ask leading questions. When you ask leading questions, you suggest feelings, emotions, experiences, and it can taint the way the story comes back. We know that a lot of false accusations was because in the interrogation room, a cop or an interrogator had a certain preconceived notion and inserted that into the way they were questioning the suspect which is why one of the tips I give in my video is non-judgment. You can't have any opinions. 
You just ask and the information has to come from the person you're talking to. The moment you insert judgment, either they close down or it paints their story through your lens. But the second thing that this demonstrated for me is how adaptable Jada Pinkett Smith is. It's almost amazing to see that in a conversation of love and compassion, she really sold this idea that wow, they have this moment, this sincere moment that she'll never forget. And then on another interview, it seemed much less personable. So it's amazing to see how she can adapt to the setting and what's required of her. And this is gonna make me suspicious of a lot of things that she says because is this the truth we're getting or is it her knowing what we wanna hear in this context and adapting to that? She talks about in this interview and in her book about her childhood. It was a difficult childhood. There was a lot of trauma there and the attempts to heal from that honestly are admirable. But we know that children who are raised in trauma become very, very good at putting on a mask. A mask that's very hard to detect because they can't bring all that with them when they go to school, when they go to their jobs, wherever it is they're going, they can't bring that with them. So they become very good at putting on a mask and adapting to situations. And I think the result of that is this. She is really good at just becoming what she needs to be in each different setting. How do you define the status of your relationship now? And what is it like? You know, right now, of course we've had, it's been an intense two years and we've really been doing some deep healing together. Like I said in the book, it's like we have this beautiful friendship and we really look at our marriage as being the cornerstone of family. We're both kind of coming up with different definitions of what marriage means for us. Yeah, but the beautiful part is that there's been some really deep healing going on. I mean, we've tried our best to get away from each other. I mean, I mean, our best and we just don't want to. Mm. So we are defining it the way that works for us. Okay, so this is the topic where she gets the most dodgy, where we're not getting straight answers, and this is consistent for every interview. In fact, my friend who's been on the channel, Nate the Lawyer, put up a really great video just a few days ago talking about how on the Today Show, in two different interviews, which were days apart, she gave two drastically different answers to this question about her relationship with Will, where one day she seemed to say one thing, and another day, just a few days later, something totally different, and he goes into great details in the history, so I encourage you guys to watch that. I'll leave a link in the description. But even in this answer, it's a simple question. What's the status? And she keeps talking about deep healing. She keeps going to that, this deep healing thing, like that's supposed to give us an answer as to what the relationship is. That's a non-answer. If I ask you, like, what's your relationship status? You know, are you still with your wife? Are you guys divorced? And you say to me, there's some deep healing going on. I don't know what that means. It's not an answer, it's so dodgy. Then she says that it's a beautiful friendship, they have a beautiful friendship, and there's certainly been times in the past where we've seen that they get on each other's nerves. Would you say she has been instrumental in you and I redefining our relationship? I would say don't just start filming me without asking me oh my goodness. if you could film Astaire, me. Astaire, come help us again, please. I'm still dealing with foolishness. Don't, no, no, she, yeah, cause she don't just, would you say that she helped us heal the hurts that we caused between one another? My social media presence is my bread and butter, okay? So you can't just use me for social media and not, you know, don't just start rolling. I'm standing in my house. Don't just start rolling. Don't Please start watch a stare at the red table because she's helped us a lot, can't you tell? So this representation that it's this big, beautiful friendship, not so sure. You know, there's even times where she says they spent quite a bit of time apart. So that beautiful friendship, I don't know if that's just like a, a fallback. Don't know what that is. And then more than once, she references how they have a different definition of marriage and they're trying to each figure out what that means. Well, listen, if two people are in a marriage and they disagree on the definition of a marriage, that to me sounds like it's not really a very healthy marriage. You kind of want to have the same definition, more or less. And I think all these things, all this ambiguity, is because she has to define this marriage, this relationship, but there's this big obstacle in her way, and it's the fact that 
she had what she's now calling adultery when she had a relationship with her son's friend. And there are a whole bunch of different opinions on this, like, well, they were technically separated, they're not separated, and that's fine. All these things could be valid, but it doesn't change the fact that she can't say that they've always had a strong, trusting relationship, it was always love. That narrative is not an option, because the moment she says that, we'll go, wait a second, you, you, you had that thing, you, the, the entanglement, you had the, the, you know, remember the... So by talking about healing and defining and all these complicated things, it kind of makes it okay that that happened because it's part of the healing process. They have to heal from that together with different definitions of marriage. Would it be easier to go and find somebody else and have a more pleasing, more comfortable relationship? Maybe, but would that get me to the person that I really want to be? I don't think so. Why is pleasing a bad thing? I don't get, I, I didn't understand that. I get how comfortable, like a relationship that gets comfortable is kind of the enemy of progress. You know, like if you're not working on things, you settle into comfort. I kind of get how comfortable could be a bad thing for a relationship, but why pleasing? Pleasing is a nice thing. So she's like kind of mocking the idea of being in a pleasing relationship. I'm in a pleasing relationship, I'm very happy. I'm pleased. The intention wasn't to... Uh... Yeah, it wasn't to save face, and yeah, it surely yeah. wasn't, and I need people to know, I didn't ask Will to come to the table. Yeah, yeah. That was not my idea. Mm -hmm. Will wanted to come to the table because he didn't want me to be there by myself. He had all the best intentions. Yeah. And got there and was, I think, his trauma response kicked in. Like, I'm not ready. So many people were like, don't do this. And I'm like, nah, I'm doing it. For myself. For myself. So once again, in the beginning there, she's taking control of the narrative. So a lot of people out there are talking about the Red Table Talk and how she made him sit down and go through that. Which for anybody who watched that Red Table Talk, it, it was hard. It was difficult to see him going through that emotion. It was, it, was, it, was, it was awful. And here she's saying that that was not her idea. So again, without addressing those comments out there, she's addressing the comments out there. But notice what happens as she says, that was not my idea. We see a one-sided shoulder shrug. Only her left shoulder goes up. Now, by this point, we've seen her shrug a lot. I don't know, and I can't do anything, and, and it's always two shoulders, and it's often the hands as well. This time, both hands on the leg, and just that one shoulder, which says it was not my idea. In his best-selling book, What Everybody Is Saying, ex-FBI interrogator and best-selling author Joe Navarro talks about shrugs, and he talks about the difference between a shrug when you actually lack knowledge, like you don't know something, or you don't have the power to do something, like actual shrugs, are both shoulders and a quick pop like this. But when it's one shoulder and it's held like this, it denotes not a lack of knowledge, but a lack of confidence. This is something that's a little bit more deliberate as an illustrator. When we say something like, ah, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about, but we're not so confident in that statement. And here it happens as she's saying that it was not her idea for him to come to the table. Now let's be clear about something. I will never say that one shoulder shrug or one blink or one something can ever denote deception. I will never say that. Behavior can never let us know when someone's lying. It can give us indications of certain things. And in this moment, her confidence in that statement doesn't seem to be that high. In other words, I don't know if she's flat out lying like it was straight up her idea, but at the very least, I think she's aware of the fact that she very much encouraged it. Like maybe he was like, hey, do you need me to come on the show? And like maybe originally it was his idea, but she really encouraged it. So I do think that she had a lot to say in him being on that episode. I mean, it's her show, so obviously she really wanted him to be there. And then at the end, she says that his trauma response came in. And yes, it did. If you watch that Red Table talk, and again, I'll leave a link in the description to the analysis, we see that anger, we see that pain in him coming through. And as someone who's known him since they were in their 20s, she would have seen that. And then she talks about how people said, don't do this, but she said, no, I wanted to do it because I'm ready. But for someone who's talking about healing and working together and all this kind of stuff, shouldn't they both be ready? Like, do you understand? Like, wouldn't it have been more appropriate in that moment when she saw the pain he was going through to say, you know, maybe let's put this on hold. We'll revisit it. We have some healing to do here. Because she puts so much emphasis on healing. So I do see an inconsistency in her saying that they know each other so well and they have this beautiful friendship and they're on a journey of healing together. But 
she had to do that because she was ready for something that's as much about him as it is about her. I mean, maybe it's even more about him because what she did caused him real pain. But I just think there's some inconsistencies here in terms of how close and nurturing they are to each other and how she was gonna go out and talk about this because she was ready. Till death do us part. And you think that there is not going to be straying eyes. To me, that just wasn't, that, that, that didn't seem realistic at all. So really quick here, first with the body language, uh, we have our hands out like this and the whole time in that clip. And in this interview with people, they weren't like this the whole time. And it's very rare to see someone talk with their hands like this. So if this is not part of the baseline, these are called stop gestures or digital extension. It's when the fingers go straight out and this is an indicator of stress. Usually when we're relaxed, the fingers relax like this when we're calm. Usually when something's startling us or something like just kind of makes us kind of instantly stressed, those fingers come out like this. And it's a subconscious indication I want something to stop. In fact, the research shows that palm out, fingers out like this, pretty much everywhere in the world is an indicator of negation. So we stop things like this. Even if we're trying to stop someone to get their attention, to say hi, hail a cab, almost anywhere this is negation. And at the end, we're seeing a lot of this negation. And she's talking about how when she took her vows in her 20s, you know, till death do us part, that she knew that there's going to be straying eyes. Notice how the pronoun there is almost missing. It's not that I'm gonna have straying eyes, he's gonna have straying eyes. It's there are going to be straying eyes. Maybe it's gonna be him, maybe it's gonna be me. So again, kind of normalizing or, or implying that of course there was gonna be infidelity. It wouldn't make sense to not have infidelity and trying to normalize that behavior. And at the end, she's flat out saying like that didn't seem realistic at all. So there it is, that's the negation. Like this idea, and that, that's why I think the hands are up the whole time. Like this whole idea of death to us part, nope. Not, you know, the expectation that we're not gonna look elsewhere, nope. So that whole concept to her, we're seeing this negation. There are different stages in my marriage where Will and I decided we were not together. Where we didn't, you know, we didn't tell the public. I was actually thinking about divorcing, separating. I mean, there've been several of those. So again here with the stop gestures, but those come right towards the end when she's talking about divorcing, separating, a lot of those. These moments where they were gonna end, stop their relationship. So again, we're seeing these notes of negation in this concept of that relationship ending. Um, and here she's saying that this was, you know, this was Will and I, it was both of them. Because we're only aware of this big thing from her side, but I think she wants us to know that, you know, there were times where she thought of divorce because of something that he did. And it's interesting because if that was the case and if it's all about opening up and stuff, why didn't we talk about those things at the red table and talk about the things that he did that would have caused a rupture to the relationship? So here she's insinuating that these things exist and maybe we need to buy the book to find out. But to me, it kind of seems a little unfair that they talked together about what she did at the red table to the public, but now she gets to go alone promoting her book to talk about the rockiness of their relationship by herself. You know, why don't we get to hear from him as well? And, and maybe we will soon, I hope we will, but it just kind of seems weird how that one was the two of them and this is just her. Another thing that surprised me about this one is that she flat out says that they were talking about separating and divorcing but they never told the public. She's quite clear about that. Therefore, if we go back, why would it surprise her that in public, he called her his wife at the Oscars? You know, earlier she was all like, God, oh, me, the wife. And this is a theme we see with her, just like the video that Nate the Lawyer made. And a lot of responses here where one second they were divorced and it was, you know, it wasn't on paper, but it might as well have been a divorce. And then the next second, you know, we've been working on it and we've never been closer and we've been healing together. So it's, 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 very, it's very dodgy. So in conclusion, what do we have? I think a lot of people are gonna look at these interviews and see someone who is manipulative and who is twisting the narrative to get attention to her book and to herself. And others are gonna look at this and see a flawed person like all of us who's sincerely trying to work on herself and send a message of love and doesn't really have all the answers but she's trying to work on it to better herself her relationship and share that message with the world. As far as I'm concerned, like everything else, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. 
My regular viewers know I really have extreme views on anything. Do I think she's a horrible monster who just wants to manipulate everyone and will to get her way? I don't think that. Do I think she's a saint who is all about love and healing and compassion has it all figured out? I don't think that either. I think she is a flawed person. I think she's made mistakes. I think she does reflect about those mistakes. It was nice to see some accountability here, finally. I think she does have the ability as a talented actress to shift the way she delivers things to suit the moment. And I think for a lot of people that sets off red flags, justifiably so, it seems a little inconsistent when she says one thing and then something totally different. And we're getting a lot of that, especially when it comes to her relationship with Will. Look, I think the simple truth is she doesn't know what their relationship is. He doesn't know what their relationship is. It hasn't always been the same. And she's trying to represent that she has answers, but she doesn't yet. She's still on a path of discovering what this relationship is. And I do believe that to a certain extent, if she was gonna take this book tour and talk about their lives, it would have been nice if in one or two of these interviews, he was there as well, so we could get a more balanced approach. I get that it's her book. I get that she's telling her story, but because it's so centered on him and a lot of people care about what's going on with him, it would have been nice to hear from him as well. That's my personal opinion. You don't have to agree. But do let me know in the comments what you think about this whole situation and what you think her intentions are throughout these clips. I can't wait to read the comments. I know there's gonna be all kinds of people thinking all kinds of things, but please let's remember to keep it respectful. In these cases, there aren't any absolute truth. We're all bringing different experiences into this and having conversations to try to figure out all together what we think is going on. So remember to keep it respectful and I will see you on the next one.